All right, you guys asked for it. Everything wrong with an 8.3 Cummins. Now, before you say nothing, obviously there's some issues because this one's got a hole in it. All right, the 8.3 Cummins, kind of the big brother to the 5.9, but they don't share that much in common. Um, they do have a couple small issues, but overall it's a very, very good engine. Unlike the 5.9s, uh, they don't suffer from the killer dowel pin. Uh, doesn't matter what year of engine it is, whether it's the early B series or the C's or the caps, they never had that dowel pin that would rattle out land in your gears, and chew up your timing cover. If you were on the engineering team at Cummins at the time, and you were the one that put that dowel pin in there, can you get a hold of me? I just, <laughs> it must suck watching all these videos going, yeah, <laughs> that one little thing caused so much damage. It is a wet sleeve engine, so to rebuild them is immensely more cost effective than rebuilding a dry sleeve like its counterpart, the 5.9. Um, the DT466 is also a wet sleeve, so um, what that means is you can replace the entire sleeve and get a brand new uh, cylinder that's already pre-honed, uh, measured for out of round, perfectly matched with a piston that you can drop in and, and sleep good at night. Um, the biggest problem with uh, the 8.3 is that it weighs so much. Um, you guys are thinking, okay, 8.3, I'm gonna put this in a pickup or in some cool conversions. It's not a great fit because it's about 2,000 pounds by the time you add the weight of the oil, the extra oil, the coolant, turbo, all that fun stuff. You're looking at a very limited amount of platforms that can actually hold this. Tie rod ends, you got all that extra weight to turn the tires, they're gonna take a beating. Um, things like suspension, travel, all of that makes it ride like crap. Um, it's fun to do the conversion, have some fun with it, but um, if you want something practical and as a daily, um, the 8.3s don't make a very good swap unless you're going into like a 4500 or 6500 chassis and up. I I've said it before that um, if it's just in a road vehicle, then um, it's probably not that great of an engine, but these are in agricultural, you see them in a lot of motorhomes. If you're looking at those different applications, they do different things, so you really gotta be aware of what you're looking at. Um, this is out of a combine. You can check out that series where we placed the truck engine into a combine. Pistons are slightly different, the head is different. Um, this one would have came with a water cooled for the air, so it means that there is a cooler in the intake there that you run coolant through to cool down the air that's going in. Um, it doesn't have the room or the filtration for an air-to-air. -air. If it's a truck application, it's probably got air-to-air, -air, so it's got a completely different cylinder head again. This one uh, had a hole in it at about 7,000 hours, and that's actually pretty common for combine engines, uh, what we're told. There's a lot of combines in scrap yards with holes in them around that hour time because that's, that's when it seems that they want to let go. These engines are set up from 240 horse up to 430, I believe. I think stock 430 was the highest horsepower, but they're very torquey engines. Okay, so this is the P-pump that came off of the 8.3. It is completely mechanical, meaning that there's a camshaft um, underneath each one of these plungers. The, uh, the lift pump from the side of the engine puts fuel into the plungers. As it's turning, the camshaft lifts up, it sprays the fuel out, and um, it goes to the injectors, overcomes the spring pressure on the injectors and makes it run. Just like the 5.9, these are very easily to tune. Um, they are set up the same way with the governor springs through here. Take that out, you can get uh, heavier springs for it, which increases your RPM. Um, you can slide your uh, fuel stop ahead. So you can take this cover off and um, basically your rack pushes up against something that that meters how much fuel you're putting in. So if you back that off, the, the rack is able to move farther, you get more fuel in there. Same with your AFC housing, you can um, control how much uh, air goes in from your turbo to go against the diaphragm to push back on the rack. It's basically get the fuel inside the engine and you can add more power. These injection pumps won't work on a 5.9 because they get lubricated through a little hole right there whereas the 5.9s get lubricated on the side of the pump with a little fitting in here. Because there's a camshaft, there has to be oil in here. Um, if you wanted to swap it, I guess you could drill holes into the side and try and tap it. You're likely gonna get filings inside. Basically, you need to rebuild the pump or you need to swap over the entire timing cover and it really doesn't make sense to do so. 
These pumps are pretty well indestructible. Um, they last forever. They can make a crazy amount of power, but they also increase back to that big downfall where it weighs so much because this thing weighs a pile. So they stopped making this for on-road applications. I think they continued using the P-pumps and the different pumps in agricultural, but for on-road stuff in 1998, they went to a CAP system, which was a Cummins accumulator pump system, which involved a computer, ECM computer, on the side of the block with a injection pump still driven by the timing cover. Now, exactly like the BP-44, it suffered from the same exact issues. If you guys know what the BP-44 weaknesses were, it was the lift pump, and then poorly filtrated fuel or water in the fuel really damaged those pumps. Heat was a huge issue, so if you got the engine too hot um, or basically got under the hood there too hot, um, it could do damage to the electronics on the pump and on the computer, and it's hard to diagnose which one is which. The 8.3s were a lot less common than the 5.9, so there's a lot less of them out there, which means that the parts are a lot more expensive and harder to find at the same time. You'll see a lot of the cap systems on motorhomes, uh, things like that, and most motorhome owners are very happy with their system. Basically, the engine will outlast the motorhome. Motorhomes, if, if you see one with 200,000 miles on it, that is a very well-used motorhome. Most of them never make it past 100,000 miles. So that being said, it's a very reliable engine with the CAP system and it will last you the 100,000. It's a very good idea to put a fast fuel system on there, get the extra filtration in there. Um, when there's an issue, it's hard to tell whether it's the computer or the pump. Um, there's an accumulator in there and it has to be timed with the distributor um, and it's a very complicated pump all to get better fuel to change your timing on the go um, you're able to change your torque curves and all that and have better emissions but when it breaks it is super expensive unless you know exactly what you're doing when you're working on them and when i mean exactly i mean that a misdiagnosis can easily cost you three thousand dollars and before they're all done you got five thousand dollars in the fuel system and you still haven't even opened up the engine you still have a used engine so keep that in mind if you can find an older motor home with a mechanical injection pump on there the things that suffer is you get ugly wallpaper and and out of date cabinets that don't look so fancy but you'll have a more reliable engine in the end um, at the end of the day, how much time do you spend in the motorhome? I wouldn't get too much worried about it. It's a really bad day when you get a bill from $5,000 from a Cummins dealership saying good luck and they're waving at you as you're driving away. So the CAPS pump was used from 1998 to 2003 and then in 2004 they came out with the common rail system. Uh, we won't get into the common rail system, we'll, we'll wait until we have one of those in there and then we'll go over that when we get one of those in the shop. As for the bare bones of the engine, um, there's really nothing wrong. I don't like how they put this um, exit from the water pump right up against the oil cooler, meaning that every radiator hose, even just to slip it on is super difficult and any 90 will really slow flow down. In the combines, they had a cooling issue and I don't understand why they couldn't have made a nice gradual turn um, rather than a sharp 90 coming out on an angle here. I think that would have solved a lot of issues. But I think that it's only the agricultural ones that had a main issue with cooling. Uh, Motorhomes going down the road are happy chugging along and they don't generally have overheating issues. As for cylinder heads, they're generally pretty good. I have heard of exhaust manifolds cracking, so if you are looking at buying a used one, that might be something to look for. Um, I think there was an update, especially in the motorhomes. I don't know if it was a recall, but at least there was an updated exhaust manifold from what I can remember that didn't crack like the, uh, the original ones did. Other than that, it's a very stout engine. Um, if you're buying a motorhome that has an 8.3 in it, I would sleep well at night in the motorhome knowing that that Cummins is right underneath the bed. These, these 8.3s don't have tappet covers, so that's one less thing to leak. Um, they are a very, very good engine, and uh, if it wasn't for the weight, we would probably be using them in more swaps. When I had a co-op uh, at the heavy equipment sh shop that I uh, did my co-op at, obviously, I was the young guy that laid underneath the engine um, and got the tool ready to pull the wet sleeves. As soon as the liner pulled, you'd get coolant <laughs> lying on your face, and 
Uh, the shop didn't have any mirrors. <laughs> My face was black. I've been filthy for as long as I can remember. So uh, one of our viewers came to me and goes, I've got this easy pull liner puller and I want you to try it out. So basically this is a spring loaded contraption that you can stick in the cylinder from the top. It's going to grab your cylinder. Um, very simple. Put a, put a cap over top and pull your liner. So in this kit, you get a spacer to allow your sleeve to go up. You get a long rod that's threaded on both ends. Short threads go at the bottom, long threads go at the top. Stick it through your holder, the bottom, your contraption that goes and pops underneath the cylinder in the bottom. Obviously goes and spins on the, on the bottom of it. You got a spacer so that you don't smash your wrists on this as you're cranking it. You've got a bearing to allow the uh, nut to spin, which is this. And you got a nice ratcheting wrench to tighten your whole assembly down. All you need to do is pop that sleeve off of the O-ring and bam, you could pull all six sleeves in, I would say, 15 minutes. Let's see how easy it is. We got a bearing. Oh, you can buy these on eBay actually. So let's see if it's any good. This is the first time I've used it. I think squeeze it together, shove it in, slide that over top. I imagine this goes here. Imagine the bearing so that you can spin it. Down until you hear it click. Oh, nice ratcheting. And there you go. It's that simple. I don't think you even have to unbolt that, you could basically just squeeze it through, slide it back in again and go right to the next hole. Very nicely built in the USA and very nice quality as far as I can tell. I think he's made some upgrades on it again since I've got this model, but uh, well worth the time if you're doing wet sleeve engines. Okay, so there is your wet sleeve. This one's missing some pieces. Don't worry about that. Three different kinds of sleeves or, or engines. We've got a wet sleeve like this. We've got a replaceable dry sleeve, meaning that it's a very skinny sleeve that slides inside the engine block. That sleeve does not come in direct contact with the coolant and won't have a coolant filter. Then there's a sleeveless engine like your 5.9, your 3126, where you cannot do anything. Your only option is to bore out the block, get oversized pistons, oversized rings, and is a much more expensive option to rebuild than a wet sleeve. Number one choice, I think, would be a wet sleeve. You can do it in your driveway on a weekend. Um, the dry sleeve is like our Perkins engine. If you wanna check out that rebuild, uh, it's a little trickier getting the sleeves in and out. And then um, if you're up on your maintenance and you hope to never rebuild it, you can go with your sleeveless engine. When we talk about wet sleeve, basically if you were to rebuild your engine, you get a pack of six of these with a piston in it. Um, what happens is because Kevin has been very up on his maintenance, you can see zero cavitation happening when your piston is going down in the bore. What's actually happening is as it's going down, the piston is doing this microscopically. What that's doing, it, it, that vibration takes the coolant that is on the outside of the cylinder and it pushes it away. When we get that vibration, it pushes that coolant away. There's nothing there to make up that space. So what it does, it takes a little chunk of the sleeve with it. And that is your cavitation. Over time, you'll take more and more material out and then you'll have a whole right through the sleeve, putting coolant into the top of your piston, or if you're lucky, underneath your piston and just into your oil pan. You'll see that when you check your dipstick and you know not to run it because you'll damage either your bearings, your crank, or you'll hydro lock it. Um, what those additives do is that same thing still happens, but what happens is when it, when it pushes the coolant away, it'll take a piece of that additive instead of the actual sleeve. Those additives disappear, 
which is why you need to replace your coolant filter uh, over and over again. You would see pit marks in between here and here. So basically, your O-ring separates your coolant on the top from your oil on the bottom. And if there was cavitation, you can see, okay, so there, there would be your um, SCAs from your filter. That's kind of what it would look like. So you, you'd be able to scratch this off. And when your piston is rocking and it's imploding, because there is nothing there behind it, it would take this green stuff off and not take the steel out. If you follow the, the proper steps in assembling a wet sleeve, um, you shouldn't cut the O-ring and you shouldn't have any issues of water leaking into your oil. Before we put the oil pan on, um, we'd always bolt the cylinder heads down, we'd fill it up with coolant, we'd pressure check the cooling uh, system, usually overnight. We would put it up to 15 PSI, whatever the rad cap recommended, come back in the morning if there was any drops down below, um, then you definitely cut this O-ring. Smart thing to do before you put your oil pan on and assembled everything and realize that there's an issue afterwards. So that is your wet sleeve 101. So if I missed anything or I have something incorrect, definitely comment down below. Um, if you guys had experience with it, um, I really encourage you guys to read the comments down below. I don't always get everything right, but there's a lot of people that have had more experience with these engines than I have. Um, definitely check them out. When we get these engines in, we'll do these reviews. This isn't to harp on an engine. It's not to harp on one um, that is terrible. We make these videos just so that you're aware of what could cost you money if you are gonna buy one. Um, if you're having a certain problem with one, maybe we've given you an answer in the video. If not, hopefully those answers are in the comments down below. So thanks for watching. More of these coming up. Um, this one's going into the scrapyard and uh, that's all that it's good for. Although I kind of wanted to um, cut the cam off at number four, see if we could get it running on four cylinders, but it's too late for that. So thanks for watching. Remember, get out there, get filthy. If you're not filthy, you're not rich. <laughs>